afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the ALMT Legal Webinar Series. My name is Tadira Ranina, and I'm a partner with ALMT Legal Mumbai office. The purpose of this webinar is really to share knowledge and uh, to bring to each of you sitting at home eminent speakers who are leaders in their field. As they say, every cloud has a silver lining. And I'm sure that each of you would agree that the silver lining in the COVID cloud is the extent of sharing of knowledge in our legal fraternity today. I mean, it's I've never seen something like this in my years of practice. And so this definitely is a silver lining. To that end, today's webinar is on interpreting the Constitution, theories, doctrines, and controversies. And our speaker is Mr. Arvind Datar. I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Datar to you. And while I'm sure that most of you are aware that Mr. Datar is a senior advocate practicing in the Supreme Court, the Madras, and other high courts, here are some of his accomplishments. He's the author of several books, such as the Commentary on the Constitution of India, the third edition of which will be released in August 2020, Guide to Central Excise, Guide to Excise Procedures, and is the co-author of Nani Palkiwala, The Courtroom Genius, with Mr. Soli Sorabji. He is the chief editor of the forthcoming 11th edition of Kanga and Palkiwala's Law and Practice of Income Tax, and has been the general editor of the Feshrift published on the birth centenary of Mr. Nani Palkiwala. Mr. Datar, we really appreciate the effort that you have taken, sir, in preparing this presentation. And we are very much looking forward to hearing you this afternoon. Mr. Datar, we can begin. Please put up the presentation. Uh. Yes. Can I start? Or... Yes, please. Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks to Statira Ranina of ALMT and all our colleagues. In particular, I'd like to thank uh, Janika Solanki, Siddhi Ghatlia, and Vaisha Kapadia for making this presentation possible. I send them my slides, and they'll be helping me in making this as uh, effective a program as it possibly can. Apart from the Bombay team, I'd also like to thank uh, my colleagues in Chennai, Rahul Unikrishnan, uh, my uh, colleague uh, Janvi Sindhu in Delhi, and Gautam Bhatia, who is now in London. I must thank them for all the help and assistance. I must also particularly thank Dr. Jain, who is the principal of the IL, ILS Law College, Pune, for his uh, contribution and suggestions. Uh, when Satira first spoke to me and asked me to speak on a subject on the Constitution. I was hesitant because the, the last thing you want to hear during lockdown on an afternoon is some uh, boring topic on the Constitution. But she was persistent. And I thought that in of speaking on fundamental rights or on a particular topic, I would speak on interpretation of a Constitution. I said a Constitution because these principles apply to any Constitution. And the idea was that I will give you the theories and doctrines which will be helpful on a daily basis. Whenever we are arguing a writ petition before the High Court or challenging the validity of a statute or interpreting a constitutional provision, these principles and doctrines, theories and doctrines will certainly help us. So without much ado, I'll straight away start off. Now, the way I have uh, divided my talk is that I will, uh, uh, I have prepared about 16 slides. The first eight slides are on the principles involved, and then the remaining eight slides are on application of these principles. So you will get a mixture of theory and the practice. And I will try to explain how the Supreme Court has applied different theories and doctrines to arrive at its own conclusions. Now, let me go away uh, straight away to the and uh, I should take about 40, 45 minutes to complete my presentation. And then uh, I will uh, put it for questions and answers to those of you who wish to ask questions. So without much ado, let me start. And 
I would uh, first take the first slide. I think I hope all of you have got the first slide on the screen. And it is statutory interpretation versus constitutional interpretation. Is there a difference? I'll come to that shortly. But then one thing is, why have a what is the difference between basic statute and a constitutional interpretation? And if you see on the screen, you will find that a constitution vis a vis a statute. The basic difference is that constitution broadly gives you general principles of governance. It is a document which has a vision to the future. It tries to lay down how a particular country wants to govern itself, how the people have delegated the powers to different organs of the, of the government and so on. So you've got the theory of a living tree and so on. Now, broadly speaking, constitutions can be divided into two types, broadly. One are the short constitutions where the values are laid down, value-laden principles are laid down. And the other is a detailed constitution which is more akin to a statute, and the most common example is India. Now, the question is arise, why do you require a constitution itself? Why can't you simply have a parliamentary act to govern the daily situations? And there the answer is perhaps best contained in the Federalist, Paper 51 by James Madison. He, I've just given a nice sentence. He says, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. And as all of us know that men are not angels, none of us are. And Madison then says that because men are not angels, you require auxiliary pre 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 precautions. Very nicely put. And this auxiliary precaution is nothing but a written constitution. Let's go to the next slide, please. The second slide, please. Yes. Now, take the Constitution of India. It is a mixture of a statute and validated principles. Why do I say that? Now, if you take the Government of India Act, it had 321 sections and 10 schedules. And the Constitution of India in 1950, if you take the first Constitution, it had 395 articles and 8 schedules. And 80% of these were from the Government of India Act. So, the Constitution of India basically is a mixture of a parliamentary act, like the Government of India Act, and we've added to that fundamental rights, directive principles, and so on. So you have a mixture of a statute plus value-laden principles. Now, today in 2020, I just did a basic uh, summary, uh, analysis. We now have 425 articles. We added about 30 articles, including the articles relating to panchayats, municipalities, and cooperative societies. I really don't know why the law relating to cooperative society should be part of the constitution. It's quite baffling. We have now 12 schedules. As we speak on the eve of the 1st of May, we have had 104 amendments. And uh, that is the result of approximately 125 amendment bills which were introduced. And uh, 104 got converted into amendments. Now, if you read the constitution assembly debates, including Pandit Nehru, there was extensive criticism as to why we are having a lengthy constitution. What is the purpose? And they said a constitution should be brief, it should be small, it should contain principles. You can't have such a constitution which is 400 articles and so on. And in a really outstanding speech on the 4th of November 1948, Dr. Ambedkar rose up and justified the lengthy constitution. He pointed out practical difficulties, the nature of the Indian society. We have had different religion, different people, different languages and so on and so forth. And the most important point he makes is this. He says the way in which parliament must function, the way in which legislature must function, the judiciary should be appointed. All these, he said, I feel it's better to lay it down because we don't have, it's a new, it's a new country, it's a newly born country. We don't have constitutional conventions. And he refers to Grote and Dicey and says that we don't have the constitutional morality. We don't have adherence to conventions. And till that comes apart, there was no option but to have a lengthy constitution. And I personally feel the constitution in its present form was fully justified, keeping in mind the nature of our society, multi-religious, multilingual, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Now, the next slide is the need for interpretation. Why do you need? Now, first of all, I personally feel that Drafting an act or a constitution is extremely difficult. So what is the need for interpretation? If a constitution could be drafted with perfect English, with no ambiguity at all, then there would be no need for interpretation. Indeed, there will be no need for interpretation of any statute. But then that is not the entire problem because 
you see we have common words equality liberty religion compensation property and so on these are all the points which are of words which are have got multiple meanings multiple things which require interpretation now if you if you go to the uh, point uh, the question of interpretation the fascinating point i personally feel is that we have the same text we have the same words at the same time there are multiple views so take an example of the us supreme court lawrence tribe in his book on the silences of a on reading a constitution he points out that in 1990 see yes. in uh, lawrence tribe points out that in 1990 the us supreme court delivered 129 judgments in that year and out of 129 37 judgments were by a split verdict of 5 is to 4 so just imagine the same constitutional problem one third the judgments could have gone either way that is the really the need for interpretation and if you come back to the indian statistics it is very interesting we were so far from 1950 to 2015 there is a two volume book by mr govin goel and he has summarized the uh, number of amendments you will find that there has been one 13 judge bench which is of course kesan bharati there have been eight benches of uh, 11 judges 15 of 9 83 of 7 48 of 6 which is an even number and we have a staggering number of 2139 2150 almost five judge bench decisions i think it must have crossed 2150 by now of five judges so if you total it up you'll find about approximately we've had about uh, let's say 40 to almost 35 constitution bench decisions per year interpreting the constitution that really underscores the need for interpretation so i think this really underscores the need for interpretation now i come to two important slides which deal with theories and doctrines and then i'll go into the how these have been applied by different cases now let's go to the theories there are broadly seven theories which i have we have called out one is the textualist which says just go by the plain meaning don't go to the constitutional assembly debates don't go to the history don't go to what was discussed in parliament what was contemporary in that time simply put no text no external aids just take the text and interpret it the of course the classic example is of course ak gopalan then the earlier cases on 368 which i'll come to shortly where they simply interpreted the text and said when the meaning is plain why should we do anything else but as you'll see in a constitution you're not interpreting a sales tax law where you can go by the plain meaning you have to necessarily go into other theories next is the originalist theory or the historical theory the classic uh, illustration of this is the famous book by robert bork on the original theory the original intent as he calls it so, to put it what it requires is you put yourself in a time machine back in 1950 and find out what the constitution would have intended and then interpret or answer your problem accordingly the third is doctrinal where it's pro precedent basically it places great emphasis on following earlier precedents and it seeks to avoid departures unless absolutely necessary the fourth is very very important it's structural structure is what's the structure of the constitution what is the arrangement how are the powers divided separation of powers what is if i may put the architecture of the constitution that has to be borne in mind while interpreting your constitution the fifth is prudentialism where they try to see what is the cost and benefit involved that is if i interpret it this way what would be the implications if i interpret it the other way what would be the cost and benefit so basically it's a kind of a trade off situation where you try and see how the constitution has to be interpreted the sixth is which has got a lot of traction recently is the purpose of interpretation by aaron barak he was the former chief justice of israel a brilliant author and in his book on purpose of interpretation there is a complete chapter on constitution which bears careful reading seventh is ethical philip bobbit in his book he points out ethical is not something moral immoral kind of situation when he talks of ethics he means what is the character of the constitution what is the ethos of the indian constitution or the us constitution and the interpretation which promotes the ethos of that constitution should be followed let's go to the next slide please so these are the seven theories and uh, before i go on to doctrines i was told that in yale when uh, professor akhil amar gives gave lectures my friend janvi sindhu tells me that he used to say that these theories are like strands of a rope and you strand them together 
and then this how you can interview in, interweave these theories to answer a particular problem so that's the importance of theories from theories we go to doctrines now i'll go to them quickly because i have to finish in 40 45 minutes first is the colorable legislation the classic example was the initial thing of gajapati narayan dev where colorable means that you ostensibly are trying to show that your law is within the parameters of the constitution either in terms of competence or in terms of limitations but actually you are violating the law in other words you are doing indirectly what you can't do directly one was the uh, common example two i've just taken two cases there are quite a few of them one is the bombay tenure abolition act where where the uh, the uh, ostensibly they tried to deal with tenures but in reality they were dealing with the compensation or the rights of the tenure holder so they said it's a clear case of colorable legislation the more egregious example and the better example is the bihar ordinance where you know ordinances to be passed only for emergency situations but this dc vadhwas case where they found that the bihar government had the repeated practice of passing an ordinance allowing it to lapse the moment the legislative assembly session got over again repromulgate that ordinance again and again and again and that the in a very good judgment by justice bhagwati he says it's a clear colorable case of uh, power and they use the word it's a fraud upon the constitution that's what they say it's a fraud on the ordinance making power pith and substance is very important one is it's basically applied in interpreting legislative entries uh, a law apparently is, comes under list one but it has got overtones or some shades of this too now is it ultra virus parliament's power and there you go into the pith and substance what is the real nature of the matter and if there is incidental trenching you don't really bother the law will be still valid for example i abolish or i give relief to agriculturists what am i doing and those suppose for example those loans are based on promissory notes and negotiable instruments and i waive those loans when i'm dealing with negotiable instruments or am i dealing with money lending so the pith and substance it's for debt relief for agricultural indebtedness and it falls within list 2 and therefore it is valid incidentally it deals with other points it doesn't really matter there are number of cases i want to tell the audience that aspect theory which has been come down i personally feel it's a completely mistaken notion which our supreme court has introduced into our constitution if you read the history of the aspect theory where it came from from the privy council dealing with the canadians law where they say that a particular law may have a provincial aspect and may have a federal aspect a union aspect and a state aspect then they go on to say in the next two three paragraphs when it has different aspects you find out what is the main feature of the act what is the pith and substance of the act if the predominant feature is a federal feature and not a provincial feature then the parliamentary law prevails unfortunately we have taken aspect theory to be a separate theory separate doctrine you must understand that it is a subset of pith and substance a law has different aspects find out what is the predominant aspect and then apply pith and substance so the judgment in the federation case in my humble opinion is completely wrong go to harmonious construction that all of us know you have two conflicting provisions you reconcile them go to next slide please so the first slide deals with three doctrines i go to the next slide which deals with six more one is severability the good part from the bad part if the good part and the bad part is so intertwined that the whole statute fails then that's the sad fate of that law occupied field which says that it applies to list 3 recently the supreme court has given a judgment the on the question of uh, uh in the case of jain farm houses union where they said that if the state governments have enacted debt relief laws then under the banking regulation act you can't intrude upon that area that becomes an occupied field as far as the state government is concerned that's a completely interesting aspect there is, which has to be studied more in detail what about article 246 even if it is occupied by the state cannot parliament pass a law overriding that if it is parliament is acting within its own competence but occupied field which is normally applied to list 3 subjects has this time been applied in a conflict between list 1 and list 2 that's an interesting point but we don't have time to discuss it further reading down so idea is you save a statute don't strike it down striking down should be a last resort if possible read down a particular section and save it by 
reducing the impact of a particular provision. Prospective overruling, we know that laid down in Golaknath. Unless a judgment says it's prospective, it will operate from the previous day. Now, there are two points here I would like to share with the audience. The Supreme Court in Golaknath says it applies only to the Supreme Court. I Till today, after 50 years, I don't know why. Why can't the High Courts pass a judgment saying that we are striking down a state legislature or a union law and our judgment is prospective? What's the logic? Why can't the High Courts do so? I think they can. And other interesting case now pending before the Constitution bench in the Supreme Court is the case of the aftermath of Subramanian Swami's case. As all of you know, in this case, the Supreme Court said that, you know, there was a, under the uh, Delhi Special Police Establishment Act, the CBI, the police could not inquire into officers above the rank of Joint Secretary without a sanction, without a permission from the central government, prior permission. So, Justice uh, Loda has said, no, Article 14, corruption is corruption. It doesn't really matter whether you're an under secretary or an additional secretary or a chief secretary. All are same, strike it down. No problem with that law. Now, this case was filed in 2003 or 4. It was finally decided in 2015. What happens in those 12 years? Now, with the judgment delivered in 2015, what happens to cases which have taken place in between? There has been an acquittal, there has been a conviction, there has been a prosecution without sanction. In some cases, sanction has been refused. What happens to that? So there are judgments which say now say that if a law is struck down later, it should not disturb concluded positions earlier. That's going to be an interesting question which will come up. Eclipse, we know that when you strike down a law, the law doesn't, uh, it is only eclipsed. When that limitation is removed, the law acquires force as the Supreme Court said, proprio vigore in Vikaji Narain Dakta's case. Now, that again, for the audience, I may say that this is the huge controversy of when is a law void, when is a law voidable, if it's ultra virus the constitution, is it a voidable enactment, is it a void enactment, is it void ab initio, so many controversies come within that point also. So doctrine of eclipse within itself has got several facets. Of course, the last is proportionality, which all of us are familiar, modern dental college, you apply the law as proportionately as possible, try to have the least possible intrusion into rights. So these are the uh, nine doctrines. Two general points are raised, and I'll go straight away to the examples. Can I have the next slide, please? The next slide, please. One thing I want to clarify. There is an unfortunate observation in Vasant Kumar's case that ordinary rules of interpretation are not applicable to the Constitution. Uh, in my humble view, that is a wrong statement. In 1951, as early as 51, in Keshav Madhav Menon, dealing with the Bombay law, the constitution then said, established rules of interpretation apply to Article 13 as well. Then you go to Chandra Mohan's case, the famous judgment of Hidayatullah, where he says, fundamental rules of interpretation, fundamental rules of interpretation are the same. Whether you're interpreting a constitution or interpreting a statute, fundamental rules are same. And I personally feel, Going into this, establish See Article 367, that's the answer. 367 says when you interpret the Constitution, General Clause Act apply. Now you'll find in our Constitution, very interestingly, the definition clause is in 366. It's in part 19 towards the end. 367 is the interpretation article. It says General Clause Act applies. Now, if you go back to Government of India Act 1935, Section 311, is the definition section, but it is not the marginal note doesn't say definition, it says interpretation. Now, I was wondering why they don't have this provision of General Clause Act in 311. Then the answer could be if the Government of India Act is an act of parliament itself, then automatically the General Clause Act applies. There's no need to mention that it should be acted. But in our constitution, they took the trouble of saying for the constitution also, General Clause Act will apply to interpret. So I think that really sorts out the problem. And finally, I just was just doing some research. Common example is adjusive generis. It's applied in many taxing statutes, you know, the general words follow special words, what will happen. And I, it has been applied to Article 31A, Jagi, Inam, Muafi, or other similar grant. That other similar grant was interpreted adjusive generis, which the earlier words. So I think we can bury this controversy and say that the principles of interpretation will apply, particularly in India, where 80% of your law is nothing but the old act of parliament. Now, the next. Slide, please. 
Uh, these are basic principles. I'll just deal with dispense. I mean, dispose them off in a minute. Yes, all laws are constitutionally presumed to be constitutional. The burden of proof is on the petitioner to show it's unconstitutional. Generally, constitution must receive a broad and liberal construction. Unlike a taxing statute, which may require a strict construction, or a penal statute may require a strict construction. Here, terms will be interpreted broadly and liberally. The other important point is legislative practice is relevant, and that you can note. Those who are, are interested in making note, see Gannon Dunkley, the first Gannon Dunkley of AIR 1958 Supreme Court at page 560, where the question was, what's the meaning of the word sale? The argument was. Words in the entries must be read read liberally, so sale would also include works contract. But Justice Venkatramaya, in a brilliant judgment, said no. He said when sale was introduced in the Government of India Act and then in the Constitution, it had a definite meaning. What was the legislative practice? How did the local legislations use the word sale? In that sense, he said sale means it's nomen juris, as used in the Sale of Goods Act. There should be a transfer of goods, transferor, transferee. Uh, consideration, all these things should be there, and therefore he said, adding works contract to sale was unconstitutional, and the Madras General Sales Tax Act was struck down. Motive is not relevant. Next point, one excellent example, and I would request readers to read this judgment, listeners to read this judgment, is the Sarbanda Sonowal case, where the uh, migration from Bangladesh to Assam. This is Mathur expressly says that the law was passed with a bad motive. I have not seen, to my best of my knowledge, very rare to see a Supreme Court commenting on the motive with which a law is passed. But this is one unique example. Foreign decisions where there are conflicting judgments. I think there should be no controversy at all. We have borrowed from so many constitutions. Your 31 is from Japan. Your 25, 26 is from Ireland. Therefore, there should be no uh, objection to referring to foreign decisions where you want to interpret a constitution. So these are now eight slides, and. I'll conclude the theory part, and let's now go to how these have been applied. Now, what is fascinating is these are all theories of interpretation. The Supreme Court is faced with a problem; it has to arrive at a decision. What are what are the tools? What are the uh, what is the uh, what do you call methods by which they arrive at this conclusion? And that you can see, I have taken about four or five cases. It's not possible in the short time to deal with number of cases. I've just taken four or five cases where I found that. Different theories and different uh, doctrine have been very interestingly applied. So kindly go to the next slide. Now, if you take our constitutional history, I feel that from fifty to sixty-seven, a large part of the confrontation between the legislature and the judiciary could have been avoided. If the legislature had been reasonably fair in paying not the full compensation, but at least a reasonable compensation to the persons whose property was acquired, all this tussle was to take over the property and pay virtually nothing. Right up to bank nationalisation, this was the entire problem between the legislature and the judiciary. But for our case, let's go to the initial cases. How different theories were applied. Now, immediately after the constitution was came into force in 1950. A series of high courts struck down zamindari legislation on the ground that the principles of compensation were completely contrary to Article 31, to 14, to 191F, and so on. What was the answer? Introduce 31A, make them agree and reform the new form. As I said, to get over the zamindari laws being struck down, there are 31B, 9 Schedule. You put the law there, no challenge from Part 3. Now, how did the court uphold it? Uphold it. Shankari Prasad, they said, look at 368. If you take this uh, Shankari Prasad's case, it's a classic case of textual, textual interpretation like A.K. Gopalan. They said go by 368. It simply says you can amend the constitution. They don't say you can amend the constitution except fundamental right. There is no such provision. Anything can be amended. So why why not Part Three also? That was the logic. But I have a small caveat there. If you read the judgment carefully, I have no quarrel. You want to interpret 368, interpret it literally. But when it comes to 13, when it comes to law, then you feel that no, if law is interpreted literally, fundamental rights cannot be taken away, and then you take a different interpretation. You say law means if it's parliamentary law, it's subject to uh, Part Three. 
but if it is amendment it's constituent power and therefore not subject so this is a kind of a basic now you come to uh, so the first case was where there was a textual interpretation going by the original what the parties intended and you find in the judgment reference to the overwhelming majority of uh, the majority with the party had got they had the mandate of the people for agreed in reform all those things have influenced the decision in shankari prasad now i come to sajan singh which according to me is the most important case in this question of basic structure this is a really a turning point or a tipping point which is uh, coming to uh, which has to be considered now look at the scenario by 1965 you had 17 amendments in 15 years and for the first time two judges as i said 3 to 2 two judges hidayatullah and mudholkar they said please pause please pause is a little interpretation enough that will ask the question that take away fundamental rights he asked it very puts it very nicely he said our fundamental rights the playthings of the majority that's the question he said then he said that look we may this power amendment may not be absolute there may be some limitations but he leaves it that that and he supports the conclusion he said yes 17 amendment is valid but he flags this question on the question of the power amendment mudholkar is even more eloquent he refers for the first time and please note this is not in golaknath but in sajan singh for the first time the word essential features has been used by justice mudholkar and he says can we take away everything so that what is left is not a constitution at all and following a pakistani supreme court judgment he says essential features maybe you cannot take it away but then that is the view taken by mudholkar but for the first time you will find that textualism is abandoned and the other principles you know as to what is the structure of the constitution what is the intention of the uh, makers what are the historical background all those things are put together in sajan singh now these judges don't go theory by theory they reach a conclusion and in that conclusion you can analyze that this could be possible this could possibly be the theory they applied to reach their conclusion now go to the next case next slide please golaknath of course i want golaknath was a case where there was a 180 degree turn from a case where you power was unlimited here it says that no part of fundamental rights can be touched a complete 360 degree it 180 degree turn and subaraw judgment is interesting subaraw judgment says that his basis his reasoning or the rationale for arriving at this diametrically opposite conclusion is very interesting he says look at 368 it says procedure for amending the constitution so he saying it's not a substantive source of power this procedural sec article cannot take over a substantive article like 13 very interesting way of approaching it and he tries to trace the amending power to 248 and 97 and he says all are subject to part 13 and with this we go to the mega case the mahabharat of our constitution so to speak which is the kesan bharati case now can you see the slide carefully i have said 7 is to 6 or rather 6.6 is to 6.4 as you know golaknath was 6 is to 5 and this was 7 is to 6 i say 6.6 to 6.4 because justice khanna if you see his judgment 60% he agrees with the majority and 40% the minority i mean virtually most parts he agrees with the, uh, the with the minority and only in the case of basic features he turns the table and ultimately that became the decisive judgment now we see the background one way is that one way there is a very very interesting run up to bank nationalization to this case in bharati case please look back at history from 1967 from golak case in bharati what happened 1969 you struck down bank nationalization 1970 re purses went 1973 bennett colman went all these cases were struck down and justice homes has put it very nicely he says that the judiciary is not immune from the hydraulic pressure of what happens around them what is the hydraulic pressure of society why why think of the basic structure till pandit nehru was alive nobody thought of that they will take away article 21 they'll take away 19 nobody thought they said yes we can give them unlimited power our fundamental rights are safe that was the perhaps impression now by the time you came to kesan bharati look at the amendments 
They, or they completely got over Golaknath. They said, how to amend, even fundamental rights can be amended. 25th was very important. And 31C, that is the only part which was struck down, which was said that a legislature can make a law. It can just put a declaration that this is to achieve directive principles. Once that declaration is made, like virtually nine schedule, you can't question it beyond judicial review. Then 26th was abolished privy purses and 29th was the Kerala reforms. Now, if you read his case Bharati in full, the government actually won. They succeeded, 24th was upheld, 26th was remanded and upheld later, 29th was upheld, 25th upheld fully except that small part of 31C. So almost, it was almost like an 85% victory for the government. But the basic structure tilted everything. And why the basic structure? Now look at how the... Uh, Supreme Court. Now, if you take the minority, all have gone by textual orientation, historical orientation. But look at Khanna. Khanna goes into structuralism and see the next slide. Please see the next slide. Yes. The majority said the power to amend is not the power to destroy. You can amend it, but you can destroy it. And if you read some of the passages of Khanna, he says, look at 368 carefully. Read this section, article. It says the constitution. It says this constitution. I can amend the constitution. I can amend this constitution. So he says pre-amendment and post-amendment, the constitution will be will continue. There will be a constitution before the amendment. There will be a constitution after the amendment. You must ask yourself the question. You must ask yourself the question. Post-amendment, will what will what will remain? Will it be a constitution at all? In other words, suppose hypothetically we accepted the minority view. We go back to the case, Shankari Prasad case that everything can be amended. Suppose the government tomorrow simply removes the entire part 3, removes 25 and 26. It's the same constitution. Are we a same democracy? Are we a republic? The answer is no. And that's why Khanna then evolved the basic feature theory. So basic feature theory was basically came across a multiple theories being put together the structure of the constitution, how the amendment power is circulated, what is the interplay of fundamental rights, narrative principles, limitations on power, separation of power. All those things had a beautiful interplay and you had. Now go to the minority view. They are equally well reasoned. Equally well reasoned. Take Justice Palekar's judgment which I have cited. He makes a very interesting argument. He says that, read 68, read the text. There is no such limitation. Why are you reading into it? And he refers to Article 5, which should be Roman 5, Article 5 of the US Constitution. That has got similarity with 368. There also you can amend the Constitution by two-thirds majority in Congress. In Article 5 of the US Constitution, there is a limitation. You can't amend certain portions. So Palekar asked the question, Justice Palekar asked the question, if our makers, they obviously had the US Constitution before them, why didn't they add that in our Constitution? So that shows that they wanted to keep an unlimited power of amendment. Now, this is how the Kesan Bharati case took place. Now, please come to the next case, which I've just taken three or four cases in a shortage of time. Now, I come to the ADM Jabalpur case, and I would request all of you to read the minority judgment of Khanna. It contains the entire essence of interpretation of the constitution. I think perhaps no other judgment in one single judgment contains so many multiple principles of interpretation as Justice Khanna had. Now, I would like you to visualize the emergency. My young friends may not have been born at that time, but I've lived through it. I was in college in Bombay and we had complete emergency, no freedom, no freedom of press, nothing. Now, please see the first point. Article 21 and 22, the right to liberty, preventive detention, 22. Plus presidential proclamation under 395. Effectively, what they said was your right to approach the courts under for violation of 21 and 22 is completely gone. So textual interpretation on 21 and 22, read the articles and read the presidential proclamation, strict construction. So the majority said that putting these together, nobody can approach the court. Now it is interesting to read the High Court judgments. John Street, uh, ADM Jabalpur, 
in some of the high court judgments from bombay nagpur and so on what the high court said was 21 is suspended no problem 22 is gone no problem but if the person has been detained under misa that is maintenance of internal security act the dreaded misa as it was called but the provisions of misa are not satisfied or have been violated then we can set aside the detention and grant relief on the ground of violation of misa and not because 21 is affected 21 is still there but if the statutory provisions are invalid have not been complied with he has to be set free and they said 226 there is no limitation you can we have got powers to do it the word is other purposes but sadly high courts are overruled and the supreme court said even if the detention was contrary to any law any regulation still high court said no power under 226 to set at right a person even if the detention is invalid and they said that even if your fundamental rights are not violated no relief they simply said yes your detention is invalid you must read the majority judgment they say yes the detention was invalid but your right to approach the court is gone in other words there is a right but there is no remedy during the remedy now please come to khanna's judgment now in this historical background where there is sort of darkness as far as all human rights are concerned everything is suspended courts have gone complete into the limbo you had then the 46th amendment followed but you must see khanna's judgments the way he applies multiple theories and says that look notwithstanding the emergency notwithstanding suspension of all rights the right to life still remains the powers of the high court and the supreme court still remain now look at what he does first it's not a very big judgment it's about say about 100 paragraphs and i would recommend everybody read it he first starts off with plato goes to the magna carta goes to us supreme court he then goes to the judgments of lord atkin and so on in the second world war where despite the uh, emergency powers the courts interfered in certain cases so he goes into all that then second part so the first part is like a historical part of the interpretation theory of interpretation then 21 khanna makes a very important point just as he says that 21 is not the source of right to life he says go to pre 1950 go to section 491 of the crpc even before independence in colonial britain in england colonial india You had the right of habeas corpus. A magistrate could cause the habeas corpus were there with the criminal courts. So he says the right to life is not granted by twenty one. Right to life exists. Then the next point, which I think is absolutely magnificent, is the rule of law. In about eighteen or nineteen paragraphs, Justice Khanna discusses rule of law and says that in a country of rule of law, notwithstanding suspension of right, rule of law still prevails that can never be taken away. Please go to the next. slide after analyzing he makes a very passionate plea you can see always the man grappling struggling to give relief he says if you accept that 21 is gone 22 is gone and you have no remedy before any court what are you saying what is the consequence of what you're saying you are saying that the executive is not governed by any law the executive is not answerable to any court and that he says is not permissible under our constitution notwithstanding suspension of these rights he then goes on to un declaration of human rights that we have signed the charter then he again goes to historical method of interpretation he says look at the us constitution now the argument was under article 24 226 you can issue writ of mandamus certiorari quorunto and habeas corpus the presidential proclamation does not suspend Article two twenty six, and Justice Khanna says, look at Article one, Section nine of the U.S. Constitution. There, habeas corpus can be suspended in terms of armed rebellion and certain other cases. He says we have got Article two twenty six, we have got the habeas corpus, but we never included that provision. So, if you go by textualism, also go by historical provisions, also Khanna says there is no way you can take away right and liberty. And finally, he makes a conclusion and twelve reasons. and to my audience i would suggest i would strongly recommend you please read this minority judgment and to make it easier and more enjoyable i may use the word go to his conclusion in para 220 of the ai reports 12 reasons are given for his conclusion 
read the conclusions first and then you please come back to the reasoning which he gives that will make it more interesting let's go to the next i'll now shortly wind up next slide, please yeah what are other examples like i have not included many like indira gandhi's case i didn't mention because of shortage of time but you take for example uh minerva mills what did minerva mills do the 42nd amendment tried to set at not case and bharati they didn't succeed in this review case then they had this 42nd amendment where they simply said any amendment of the constitution from 1950 onwards shall not be questioned on any ground whatsoever so every amendment became judicial review proof nobody could question any amendment supreme court very interestingly said amending power itself is subject to judicial basic structure and they struck down those provisions 4 5 and 52 of the 42nd amendment act the amendment to 368 was struck down then sp gupta's case very interesting this is again shows the importance of interpretation the word used in article 124 is consultation in 1982 consultation means doesn't mean concurrence now take sp gupta's case it's very fascinating how consultation in 1982 mean meaning it means only consultation that you have only the judiciary didn't have the last say executive was the last say how does it become concurrence how and why there again the hydraulic pressure theory what happened in society why was this necessary why had to give a purpose of interpretation to 124 of course it has got a lot of critics people say there is no basis for completely changing this but again this say they used different methods of interpretation a lengthy judgments have been given by people and said why ultimately judiciary must have the last say in judicial appointment so consultation becomes concurrence take madras bar association where the national tax tribunal act was struck down what did the supreme court say in our constitution take the structure of the constitution this is a classic structural case core judicial functions what are questions of law decisions and questions of law they said this can never be given to a tribunal and they struck it down and finally i'll go to puttaswami's case the privacy case now, where is privacy mentioned in uh, part 3 nowhere where is it mentioned in the american constitution nowhere yet take puttaswami privacy take just a nariman judgment he traces it to liberty fraternity 191a 191d 21 what is called he says privacy permits throughout part 3 now you have a case where privacy has become a fundamental right although it's not mentioned anywhere this is the beauty of constitutional interpretation as times have gone by as we have crossed almost 70 years of our independence what was what fundamental rights were actually given we have now introduced a new right which is privacy and this judgment is an excellent example of judicial creativity and judicial interpretation and introducing privacy as part of fundamental rights last point i'll just come to the last slide next slide please now i'll this the sabrimal review is pending the bench has prepared seven questions to be referred to as a uh, nine judge bench now again all lawyers have to apply these theories of interpretation doctrines of interpretation and try to get a solution what i asked myself the question what theory are we going to apply are we going to go by the textual interpretation can we say that look look at 25 and 26 it talks of public morality don't go into history don't go into debates public morality means public morality where is the question of reading it as constitutional morality where is the place for constitutional morality then is 14 and 25 26 interdependent are you going to harmoniously interpret 14 with 25 and 26 and say that yes the right to equality is there but in rare cases like if it's a tradition of 700 years and it's not prejudicial to public interest you can have it so it's really interesting so this is where different doctrines and different cases can be applied so friends i have tried to give you the theories doctrines and discussed a few cases in the short time i've got it's already 4 o'clock in the short time i've got i could not deal with more cases but i would tell you that when you are doing a constitutional case please bear in mind these theories please bear in mind these doctrines and i thought of the analogy of 
Edward D. Bono's six thinking hats. You got the yellow hat, you got the red hat, you got the green hat, etc. And you apply different hats to a problem. So these are the different hats of interpretation, if I may say so. Depending on the question, depending on the problem, see how you can apply it and try to arrive at the solution. And with that, I will conclude by just paying a humble tribute to Justice Khanna by quoting the last part of his dissenting Redmond. And I would like all of you to read it carefully with me. A dissent in a court of last resort, to use his words, his words are the words of Chief Justice Hughes, is an appeal to the brooding spirit of the law, to the intelligence of a future day when a later decision may possibly correct the error into which the dissenting judge believes the court to have been betrayed. Nothing could be better put. I thank you all for a patient uh, audience for patiently hearing me. Now I'll answer any questions. You can ask the host to put up the questions to me and I'll answer them. First question that we have is uh, from Ami Parekh and she's asked, uh, how does one decide which theory of interpretation to apply and are there any parameters? Yes, that's an interesting question. See, now there is uh, no litmus test that if this problem comes, you can apply this theory. Suppose, for example, you're challenging, let's say, like a Sabrimala issue, you're challenging the provisions of validity of, of uh, 14, 25, and 26. I would say that you take the textual thing, read the text. Now, you want an answer. You want to say that, let's say, you want to argue for the proposition that the banning of women into the Sabrimala temple is not invalid. It should be what the old tradition should continue. Then you see what are the history, what are the textual provision, what's the structure of the constitution. So, as Akhila Mar these are all strands of different rope. You weave them to give an, an, a medical analogy. It's not just one drug for one thing. Maybe a mixture of drugs has to be given to solve a particular problem. And I would recommend that you take theory by theory in a particular problem. See whether X theory applies, then the next, then the next. Similarly, go to the doctrines wherever applicable. See what best applies to your case and then weave out your answer to your... I mean, that, that will enable you to prepare your brief for argument before court. Next, next question. Uh, yes, sir. So the next question that we have uh, is from uh, Rukved Upadhyay. Uh, his question is, how do the Constituent Assembly debates hold relevance today, especially related to those proposed amendments which were re rejected? Those proposed amendments? Which were rejected. Uh, no, I think the CAD debates, in fact, that's important because right up till... Uh, Sajan Singh and so on, they were referred to debates. Wherever you go by textual uh, interpretation, the, the judges were reluctant to go to the debate. They said, let us see the article as it is. There's no need to go to what the assembly said. But now, virtually every important constitutional case, we go into constitutional assembly debates. Now, suppose a particular provision was deleted. Why was it deleted? What was the reason? Now, for example, take the 42nd Amendment, 323 and 323B. They are now constitution, they were part of the 42nd amendment. Now in the 44th amendment, when the bill came to the parliament, when it went to Rajya Sabha, the Janta government did not have a majority. Therefore, they refused to allow this amendment. They allowed the other amendment, they didn't allow it. So this is a case where they rejected the proposal. And that's the reason. Now suppose, for example, a particular uh, word was by the amendment. Then you can use it to say that, look, the interpretation put by the other side is not correct. One reason could be that though this was proposed in the amendment in the Constitutional Assembly, they thought it that it is at best it should not be included. If they thought so, then why interpret it in that particular manner? Next, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question that we have is from Malik. Uh, the question is in the case Animal Welfare Board versus Union of India 2014, the Honorable SC held that fundamental rights are available to animals as well. According to you, is that the correct interpretation? Fundamental rights are available to? Are, are available to animals as well. Fundamental rights are available to animals as well. I don't think it's the correct way because fundamental rights are given to persons. Only one thing you can have prevention of cruelty to animals that could be part of the, uh, uh, like what, like that may be what's called an ethical interpretation. The ethos of a civilized society prevents doesn't permit cruelty to animals. 
but I, it's, it's a far different thing from saying that they have fundamental rights. Then where do you stop? Do they have 14? Do they have 19? Do they have... Where do you stop? So I don't think that's a correct proposition. But I have to see actually in what context the Supreme Court said so. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Sanjay Jain. Uh, his question is, should unicameral parliament have been conceived as an amending body to add the ninth schedule in the constitution? His question is, uh, should a unicameral parliament have been conceived as, as the amending body to add the ninth schedule in the constitution? Uh, well, I personally feel ninth schedule should not have a place at all. But having said that, maybe yes, it should. that could have been a, a better safeguard before you put a case into the ninth schedule. You have a decision of both. Yes. Um, the, the next question is from Ganesh Rajgopalan. Uh, his question is, when do international treaties need to be implemented into municipal law? Can such implementation be partial? Can international treaty be frustrated by future legislation? Yes, yes, of course, yes. For international article 253 and our constant very clearly says the international treaty will not become municipal law unless we make a consequential parliamentary legislation. And if it's an international treaty, like for example, Vienna Convention, we have not signed it. There's so many treaties we are not signatory to. So parliament is always supreme. An international treaty by itself will not have application. But the there are a number of judgments that say that if two interpretations are possible, that which supports the international treaty should be adopted. In fact, that's also what Khanna says in this idiom Jabalpur case. Yes. Next. Right. Uh, the next the next question is, uh, sir, what is your view on interpretation given by the Supreme Court in case related to granting the status of legal person to a river, for example, the Gang Ganga and Yamuna? The Apex Court overruled the judgment of the Uttarakhand High Court in this case. Oh, well, I, I really can't comment because I've not seen that judgment in detail. Now, you just now said, can animals have fundamental rights? And you're saying river is a person. I really don't, I can't comment until I read that judgment because we have to see in what context they said so. Was there a rigorous reasoning to arrive at a conclusion that a river is a person? Then, if river is a person, then is it subject to Article 14? Can, can the river can't argue its own case? So, like an idol. Will it be a representative? So many interesting questions come up, but I don't think river is a person. That is not what is intended. Then why not forest is a person? Why <laughs> not mines and minerals persons? Where do you draw it? I don't think that's correct. Right, sir. Uh, the next question is, uh, sir, would the debate around the words constitute assembly in Article 370 also form part of the basic structure of the constitution? Uh, no, it would not. Uh, the next question is uh, whether state in Article 19.2 includes all local and other authorities by virtue of Article 12. If yes, would it mean that other authorities have constitutional sanction to make any restriction on fundamental rights? Well, if you've got, for example, it does happen that you've got the right to move the a local municipality may have some zoning regulations that restricts your movement. That again has to satisfy the test of 19.2 to 19.6. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is, uh, are there any overlapping features in the doctrine of Pithin substance and the doctrine of colorable legislation? If so, what is the fine line distinguishing the difference between the two? Uh, well, in, in, as far as uh, colorable legislation is concerned, the overlapping doesn't really arise. It arises very often in uh, Pithin substance mm -hmm. because it, and as it happened most often in taxing statutes, where, for example, let's say software, is it a service or is it a, are they goods? Or you take, for example, a common example is leasing transactions. Now, under the 46th Amendment, lease is deemed to be a sale. Transfer of right to use is deemed to be a sale. Now, so if it's transfer of right to sale, you can levy sales tax. But leasing is also a service. So you can levy service tax, which is in list one under inter 97. Now, in this case, overlapping, it can be sorted out by pith and substance. So if you ask me a question, if you are levying a tax on leasing and it has been taken under Article 366, 20, 29A as a sale, then there should be no power to levy a service tax on that leasing again. So there, pith and substance will apply. And I think Supreme Court has wrongly applied this question of uh, service tax. Take professions. Tax on professions is entry 60. You now say entry should be given a liberal interpretation. So profession will include a tax on profession can also include a service tax on profession. 
but again supreme court has gone into aspect theory it said service aspect is different this aspect is different completely mixed up the whole thing go by simple pith and substance find out the predominant nature sort out the problem thank you sir uh, the next question that we have uh, is from uh, amol kale uh, he says dr ambedkar gave us three warnings the second of it was not to lay liberties at the feet of even a great man or to trust him with power which enables him to subvert the institution can you explain the relevance of this warning for today's constitutions why today's constitution yeah. giving too much power to any one particular person is always important again you go back to madison we don't have a government of angels we require checks and balances and as it is often been quoted the person the powerful leader who it may be over the history he is doing something out what from what he believes to be right for the people but yet even if uh, i mean more rights have been violated by over zealous people believing what they are doing right and that's how you require checks and balances so right. whatever good you want to do must be within the parameters of the constitution and apart as he mentioned dr ambedkar so many things he mentioned have not been followed he for example he said don't have reservation more than 50% are you following that he said you have only up to a certain period so there are so many things ambedkar which are not followed it's very easy to quote him when it suits you but you are not followed many things of what he has said thank you sir uh the next question is from uh, hiten chande his question is Uh, whether the restriction imposed on the tribunal under section 254 of the Com of the income tax act to grant a stay subject only to a payment of 20% of the outstanding demand encroaches upon encroaches upon the judicial function of the tribunal and impinges the doctrine of separation of powers and to that extent unconstitutional according to me yes but there are unfortunately our supreme court has said that their uh, right of appeal is a creature of a statute it can be subject to certain restrictions in the case of municipal laws they have said even 100% pre deposit is valid fortunately in that maldia chemicals they said that more than 75% makes the appeal illusory and therefore it is arbitrary but according to me this 20% mandate is extremely incorrect it is a serious encroachment on judicial power and now that you ask a question i would request the audience to see a fantastic judgment of the privy council for mauritius it's called khairati's case article 1 of the mauritius constitution simply says mauritius is a country governed by rule of law that's all there was a law which said that the judiciary could not grant bail in certain drug offenses that the privy council struck down saying that if a country is ruled by law rule of law and to grant or not to grant bail is a judicial function and therefore that was struck down unfortunately we have said no we need not have grant bail like in tada cases or pota cases bail need not be granted and even today i am sorry to say that you keep on reducing the judicial discretion this gentleman's question is absolutely correct it is completely unconstitutional and it's time we relook at this entire thing of taking away powers of stay and taking away discretion apart from the stay they say beyond 365 days or beyond 180 days the stay will not continue i mean this is completely uh, um, violating our basic principles of rule of law you yes, sir uh the next question that we have um uh, is from um priyanka kamaria uh she says one argument advanced in support of the caa is that it has nothing to do with ncr uh, nrc and npr and that they are mutually distinct can speeches by can speeches made by cabinet ministers in parliament linking them to take cognizance yeah. of contesting the virus of the legislation <laughs> Did I lost this question? C A question was not heard by me fully. Hello. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes. Yes. Uh, so the question was: One argument advanced in support of the C A A is that it has nothing to do with the N R C N P R, and that they are mutually distinct. Uh, the question is: Can speeches made by cabinet ministers in Parliament? linking them be taken into cognizance in testing the virus of the legislation well the speech of parliament can definitely be referred to that won't be a clinching factor but in the course of your argument there will be one further um, one further additional argument in your favor to say that look this was what was discussed in parliament 
This is what the minister said. But that will not be conclusive. There are judgments who say that nobody speaks for parliament. Parliament passes the law and that's it. So you can't say because the minister said something, you it is bound, they are bound by it. That may not be correct. But definitely in the course of interpreting when two views are possible, what the minister said would be definitely a relevant factor. In fact, in the Aadhaar case, we did refer to statements made in parliament as well. All right. Uh, the next question uh, that we have is uh, from uh, Viraj Yargol. Uh, someone is not on mute. Please put yourself on mute. The, yeah, so yeah. the question that we have from Mr. Viraj Yargol is what is the importance of extraneous evidence in interpreting fundamental rights? So, what does he mean by extraneous evidence? If he means, for example, now for, to interpret fundamental rights, we have got constant assembly debates, we have got uh, questions and answers in parliament, they can be referred to, then you can refer to foreign decisions. So all these things are extraneous. That is mean by what is mean by extraneous evidence. Yeah, these are all uh, what you call, uh, uh, a, a, what you call, aids to interpretation, which can be referred to. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question that we have is from Ranveer. Uh, he asks, how do we place secularism in basic structure, in the basic structure of the constitution by applying the doctrines, given that it was inserted after the 42nd Amendment? Well, uh, secularism, no, no, they have now taken secularism as part of the basic structure. It was introduced, as you know, in the 42nd Amendment. And interestingly, uh, for this person who asked this question, if you see the 45th Amendment Bill, which then became the 44th Amendment Act, there was a proposal to define what is secularism. Secularism is a country which is a means which respects all religions. That was the meaning sought to be given. And the state has no religion at all. So, some inexplicable reason, the Congress party, which had majority in the Rajya Sabha, defeated this particular provision. They did not allow the definition of secularism to continue. That is the part. So I would definitely say, yes, it is part of basic structure, because if you decided to be a, a, a country where no way, it's not a theocratic country where we got a Hindu religion is a national religion or Islam is a national religion like in our neighboring Pakistan. Once it's secularism, then it's part of our basic feature. The fundamental feature of our constitution is all religions are equal. And the state respects no religion. In fact, Mr. Palkwala first said secular is a wrong word. He had a view which he gave a lecture in Madras. He said, we are not a secular state. We are a non-denominational state. That is the real thing, according to him. Anyway. Uh, so the next question that... Uh, yes, Tatiya. Okay, how, many, how many more questions are there? Uh, there are... Uh, there's one specific question and the, the other questions are a little bit more generic in nature. So, should I ask the one specific question first? Okay. Uh, so the question, uh, Mr. Tatar, is uh, is removal of holding a property from being a fundamental right to insertion in Article 300A during emergency open for challenge? No, no, because now they've held that uh, property is not a fundamental right. It's also not part of basic structure. That chapter is over now. Okay. Um, th there are there are a couple of uh, fairly generic questions, Mr. Tatar. Uh, do we have time yeah. for those? Yeah, we can go on till 4.30. I mean, if the audience is willing to... Uh, we can go on from the 10 minutes. Okay, sure. Uh, so, one question. Uh, so, Fadeen Khan has two questions. The first is, are good intentions more important than written laws? And uh, the second is, why do we talk about human rights and not human responsibilities? Uh, well, uh, yes, good intentions. As I said, men are not... Uh, we don't have a government of angels. And uh, I think all law must start with a good intention. If the intention is bad, then again, that augurs ill for the citizen. Of course, motive is not a relevant factor. But to answer his questions, good intentions, not a question of more important, good intentions are as important as reasonable laws. In fact, good intention is the starting point or the, what you call, is the uh, acorn which leads to a oak tree of good laws. And the second question I didn't follow. What was it? Second one? What was the second question? Yes, yes, sir. The, the second question was why do we talk about human rights and not human responsibilities? Uh, well, we, yeah, uh, we, well, we have we, got, uh, we, they are human rights and they, of course, they are corresponding uh, limitations also. 
they have put a duty there but our constitution has not imposed an obligation that there is a duty but there is uh, no corresponding obligation in fact to tell him john f kennedy had a very good quote he said that all of us have the fundamental right of speech but we don't have the obligation to think before we speak that's a mm. problem in all constitutions yes kaam to karna padega samjhe hindustan se zyada ishara support karta hai hello yes mr kavita ji please put your cell phone mute um we have been have a question from uh, mr sirai who has asked uh, does the supreme court pay heed to well settled principles of interpretation reading several judgments one gets the feeling that each judge is a law to himself uh, when it comes to interpretation uh abros thanks for that question and i can't agree with you more i think the increasing trend is you first decide on a uh, on a conclusion and then you you decide a conclusion irrespective of whether it can be supported by rigorous reasoning or not that is increasingly happening and it's not a very good thing of course we have good judgments like the privacy judgment or we have got the whatever it is well reasoned judgments you may or may not agree with the conclusion but good reasons are there but increasingly i have a feeling as a student of law that there is no rigorous application of a particular theory to arrive at an answer if a question is put and you want to answer you must rigorously test it it does it satisfy this theory does it satisfy this doctrine is it what the framers intended and then come just because a conclusion is to your predilection you should not simply go by it i fully agree with novos there is an increase i think there is a need to have more rigorous reasoning in many of our judgments the other point is that you know unfortunately uh, we have abandoned this question of uh, constitution cases being decided only by five judges now you have two judges benches deciding far reaching cases on legislative competence overlapping and so on and so forth but then we don't have one supreme court but we have multiple supreme court and with 34 judges and almost 14 15 benches theoretically you can have quite inconsistent incoherent views unintentionally but that's what happens and there is also a, an increasing tendency of like for example suddenly you say that all deemed universities are also uh, public servants and therefore the subject and the answer is the preamble is important corruption is not there and so on but this is not a rigorous reasoning at all uh, mr sidra is there anything that you would like to add uh okay we can move on then to the next question uh the, there is a question uh from uh shutanjaya bhardwaj uh, who has asked uh, should original provisions of the constitution uh be challengeable against the basic structure uh what about original provisions no no not at all not at all the next fact, question is in, from mudit sorry fact, sir koilo they say that the basic structure will apply to all amendments post 24th april 1973 so you can't now challenge the fourth amendment bela banerjee's case as violating basic structure you can't do that please thank you sir um i think uh, the next question that we have uh is uh is constitutional morality and overreaching interpretation what is the limitation of such a principle uh i my in my personal first of all it's a highly nebulous term what do you mean by constitutional morality do you mean in terms of the ethos of the constitution do you mean in terms of the values of the constitution yes it is for example taking away the right to life and liberty is an act of constitutional immorality to that extent even abolishing privy purses is an act of immorality if you ask me it's constitutionally immoral to take away a solemn promise made by sardar patel so the whole issue of morality will now constitutional morality will now be tested before the sabrimala bench as and when it sits recent past in the case of the national capital territory of delhi justice uh, deepak mishra has gone into detail on constitutional morality and then said that it's a ground even to strike down a legislation which i have my serious doubts it has to be tested more carefully because what happens is there are 800 high court judges and each one have a different perception of what is moral can you start striking down legislation even in sabrimala case i don't think you can take public morality as constitutional morality but now the whole thing will be revisited but i think this constitutional morality should 
it's become a flavor of the season everybody keeps talking about it but it has got a very 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 limited scope in the way ambedkar used it and the way it is there it is basically means reverence for the constitution or respect for conventions but it is not a tool to strike down a legislation thank you sir uh, i think the next question that we have is uh, uh, from mr hitesh vachani who says uh, sir can state government challenge the constitutional validity of the central law and the high court and the article 226 if it violates the fundamental rights of the citizens and what are its implementation how do we interpret article 226 in that context ah uh, well uh, basically that's a interesting question whether they go on article 131 or they challenge it uh, i have feeling they should go on article 131 and not challenge it under 226 on violation of fundamental rights because i don't think you can have a case of state of tamil nadu versus union of india in the high court deciding the issue then can the tamil nadu judges decide that what about the question of bias can this, this court decide the same question so that's a very larger question but i think they should preferably go under article 131 thank you sir uh, and the last question that we have is uh, from uh, mr ali fazal bhai uh, he and other, asks and, and the other thing in the all the question is the rights are given to a person now whether the state itself is a person again becomes a big question now uh so um, alif asks should we not educate citizens about fundamental duties as much as we do on fundamental rights yes i think we should we should do fundamental duties on article 51a we should uh, uh, in educate citizens not only citizens we should also educate our parliamentarians members of the assemblies also about the fundamental duties thank you very much sir uh, statira we we do have some more questions but i think we're now running out of time How many are there? Oh, yes. How many are there? Because I don't want to disappoint anybody. There are two, three there, more. There, there are quite a few, unfortunately, sir. Okay, okay, okay. You, if there are one or two of them, I can take them because what's the time now? Because I've got another conference at four forty-five. It's uh, it's nearly four thirty, sir. It's four twenty-eight. Okay, five minutes. Let's go on. Okay, sure. Uh, so. Uh, the person here has not given the name, but they've said uh, Keshav Nanda is a prime example of constitutional interpretation, much beyond textual interpretation, with an end goal in mind. Do you think the liberty taken in interpreting the constitution in this fashion proved to have more downsides than upsides several decades later? For example, the Collegium system. Ah uh, well, I think we should not link up the basic structure of Kesan Bharati with the Collegium system. They are two completely different compartments. and uh, i personally feel basic structure was an absolute necessity and one can imagine it's difficult to imagine what would be the consequence in fact we may not be having this webinar if we didn't have the basic structure we would have lost our independence long long ago or when I mean, liberties long long ago so the basic structure was a right step it was not taking a liberty it became a necessity to preserve and protect the constitution and i would fully support the theory of basic structure it was necessary i don't agree with the textualists and the original intention that it has no place we required the basic structure because you see beyond a particular point of time we are not a government of angels but if then we have a government where you have dynastic politics you have cases where they are one third the legislatures are accused of serious crimes if that is the structure of your legislative assembly you require some serious check and one of them is basic structure Thank you. Yes, uh, there is a person who has asked for your opinion on the Sabri Mala case. Well, I am appearing in the Sabri Mala, so I won't answer. But it raises very, very interesting Thank cases you. of constitutional interpretation. It may not be proper for me to comment on them, but it's an interesting case balanced on both sides: interplay of equality, religious rights, and so on. Let us see. And it's not just Sabri Mala; there are also the Parsi cases there, the Muslim uh, cases there. They are all religious. Religions are involved in this particular case. You see the seven questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next question is: What is the extent of restraints offered by Part Thirteen of the Constitution on states' power of taxation? Is the Jindal Steel uh, the latest position on the issue, which is the entry tax judgment? No, see, Part Three is different, and Part Thirteen is different. Uh, in my personal view, the Jindal judgment is incorrect. Article Part Thirteen talks of 
you in between interstate trade and commerce no state can make a law which will create imbalance between interstate commerce i don't see why that's excluded and my personal view is the view that laws have no tax laws have no place in part 13 is incorrect in my view okay uh, thank you sir the next question is from deepa patturkar she asks how do we interpret the article which empowers the governor to nominate persons from various fields to legislative council of state with special reference to maharashtra uh, when well, that's a very very controversial and burning topic uh, on nomination of members article 121 uh, actually if you see you can nominate people only for science literature arts and so on now this is also again going to raise very interesting questions of interpretation that where a person is not been elected can he continue as a minister through the nominated route and that requires a whole lot of uh, study into what is the concept of nominated members for example they don't have the right to vote they don't get mp that funds so is the same kind of member can he be a minister can he be a chief minister it's a very very interesting uh, question yeah that's a nice point he has raised but it requires more study which frankly i have still to do thank you sir uh so there are still more questions coming in so i think this will go well over the time that you have allocated for us uh, yeah just on the few minutes here session yeah, another three four questions on this topic i don't know if people are, let's go for another three four questions because people have asked them with so much sure. enthusiasm i don't want to disappoint them sure sure Uh, so the next question is from Shiva K, who has asked whether the medium to access the basic necessary fundamental rights form part of basic structure. For instance, in An- Anuradha Bhashin, it was held that internet is necessary to carry on trade, which is a fundamental right. Now, when the government amends the laws relating to the medium to access the basic fundamental rights, the fundamental right itself will get compromised and may affect the basic structure. What is your view? I I feel that Anuradha Bhashin's case. i feel the supreme court should have gone one step further there is no point saying that right to internet is part of freedom of speech and expression and yet not making it mandatory in my personal opinion if you, jammu and kashmir is part of india we removed 370 they have got the same rights as us i don't see why they should not have the right to internet no point simply saying that yes 19 is there give a very nice picture of what is 191a but then don't bite the bullet and say that look you have to give internet depriving a person of internet today is actually in life and liberty and there's no point saying i'll give them 2g i'll give them 3g they're entitled to every part of india is entitled to the internet subject to various safeguards if they can be internet in assam and other parts why not in jammu and kashmir thank you sir uh, the next question is from ayush bahiti um he asks um would application of different theories not lead to uncertainty uncertainty because of the subjects are not sure as to what would be the position of law uh, no i don't agree at all the point is these are different theories available now these have been characterized categorized by various legal scholars as textual prudential etc etc so depending on the nature of the challenge of a constitutional provision you can use a particular theory so it's not that you can use a theory to come to a uh, different views of course to answer him yes we must it is possible you can have different views case in bharati was 7 is to 6 applying the same theories but that is part of the democracy that part of that the beauty of our constitutional system and very often the minority view take for example anwar ali sarkar take the early judgment stick uh, your adim jabalpur minority view dissenting view became was later upheld in the privacy case so great dissents are actually and very often you find that great dissenting judgments have become the law after 10 15 years so i would say that different theories if they give rise to different views we should not be worried about it we should welcome it you have a better legal you got different view points and you see which is the best thank you sir uh the next question that we have is uh, from mr amarnath bn uh, he asks the basic structure doctrine developed in the keshananda bharti case is applicable for the amendments to the constitution can this doctrine be used for challenging constitutional validity of a legislation like ex legislation is unconstitutional because it is violative of basic structure yes yes you can now it's been settled it it had been my view from the beginning that if a law can be violative of basic structure uh, let's say for example secularism secularism is not mentioned anywhere in any statute but suppose you make a law which is anti secular why can't be struck down as part of basic structure separation of powers 
separation of powers is in article 50 which is a directive principle why can't you have a system where you can strike it down on basic power but that issue is now settled by the uh, madras bar association case in the national taxation tribunal case where they said it can be invoked to ordinary statutes also thank you sir uh, the next question that we have is uh, is the garr under income tax act beyond the scope of entry 82 No, no, no. It is not. It is an anti-avoidance measure. It is not beyond anti-avoidance. Not at all. Thank you, sir. I think we'll have two, three uh, questions more, and we'll stop because I've got the next conference at four forty-five. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the next question is: uh, In the last two decades, which are the court judgments you think stand out as, as the best examples of upholding constitutional values? Ah, uh, best easily the right to privacy. Then you have the uh, Article I mean, Section three seventy seven judgment. Um, then uh, these are two immediately which come to mind. Then there are there, for example, you take Ruma Paul's judgment on Godfrey Phillips. That's a very very important judgment. Uh, then uh, Sri Krishna judgment on Azadi Bachao. That's important on constitution. That's not a constitution judgment, but these two things immediately privacy immediately comes to mind, and uh, the three seventy seven judgment comes to mind. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the, I'll just read out two more questions now. Um, under Article Two Twenty Six, can we file a writ petition in High Court during emergency? Of course, you can. It depends on what rights are suspended by the Presidential Proclamation under Article Three Fifty Nine. Thank you. Uh, yeah, because next, see, I, 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 because. The presidential pro suppose the presidential proclamation suspends two twenty six, but now you can't do that because now after Chandra Kumar two twenty six one thirty six are basic structures. There is no question of it being suspended at all anymore. In fact, for your information, the forty fourth amendment has said that even now under the presidential proclamation, Article twenty one can never be suspended. Three fifty nine has been amended. Whatever may be the emergency, you can't suspend twenty one. If you can't suspend twenty one, you can't suspend twenty six either. Two twenty six either. Sure, sir. And I think there's just one last question that we we'll get to, and then we can wrap up, uh, which is whether the coronavirus COVID pandemic situation can be considered as an emergency situation, and the fundamental right of the individual to file a case against the government can be entertained. It is not. See, first of all, they are not declared emergency, but I don't think a pandemic is a ground to suspend fundamental rights. You have number of fundamental rights. Are you going to suspend reservation? Are you going to suspend equality? I don't think a pandemic has got anything to do with fundamental rights. Okay. Uh, Only one question arises: is that public health comes under the state list? The central government can take positions as far as public health is concerned. Will a pandemic, something affecting all India, can the state centre do that? That's again an interesting question. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, thank you. I think Uh, and I must thank the entire audience for most of the questions. Being, uh, <laughs> I, must, I must thank the audience for listening to me patiently. Wish all of you wish you all the best. Take care. All the best. Uh, Mr. Datar, to say thank you for this excellent, excellent uh, presentation and uh, for all your efforts. I know you've taken substantial time in preparing the slides. It was really enjoyable. Uh, as an American author, J uh, Jacob Roker once said that the greatest threat to our constitution is our ignorance of it, and I think everyone on this call would agree that this threat is now tempered after your insightful presentation, sir. Thank you so much, Thank sir. You. No, and I, I will just with your see. I just conclude. Uh, Mr. Palkiola gave a speech in Madras in December 1970, 71, and uh, he mentioned that all members of the legislature take an oath that they will protect, preserve. the constitution but there is no obligation that they will ever read the constitution so i think all of us must at least read the raja ji rajagopal acharya in that same speech said that don't read the whole constitution at least read the preamble that's the sense of our democracy the preamble liberty equality fraternity justice for all and so on thank you so much thank you thank you very much and thanks to entire team for organizing it not at all thank you sir